So I didn't get to look what this lady does. Nick, she's just logged on. This is Gloria down at the right. And my screen, she's on the bottom of the screen. Um, we, <laughs> she's waving. <laughs> um, great. Thank you guys so much for being here. I think there'll probably be a few people logging in as we go, but um, there's so much, there would be so much great information. I'm really thrilled. Um, this is Dr. Gloria Tucker. I will just do a brief introduction for you. Um, and then I'm gonna let you tell you tell us about you because you know you better than I do. But I so appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, we I feel really fortunate that we're gathering this group of people together, all movement specialists that I would like to call ourselves as a collaborative. Um, some physical therapists, some occupational therapists, some Pilates instructors, some other movement specialists maybe logging in as well. So um, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Tucker, uh, well, well, I don't even remember how long ago it was, quite some time ago. Um, and she, we both had a, our practices in the Bay Area. She continues to work in the Bay Area, in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and she is working, doing some amazing work with PRP, prolotherapy, and now and neuro, neuro prolotherapy as well, which is really exciting. Um, we in our studio uh, in San Rafael, California, have a lot of clients with dysfunctions that come in. And so um, we see a lot of people with all kinds of injuries, more than we see non-injured people. And so having um, somebody like Gloria Tucker around for us was, was lovely. Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit and I will be quiet and then I as I can ask you some questions and we can head on our way. Oh. Oh. Hi, uh, my name's Gloria Tucker. I'm an MD. I'm a specialist in sports medicine. And in the last eight years, I've subspecialized only in proliferative medicine. Um, and what that is, is uh, a means by which to strengthen the ligaments, tendons, and joints um, using injections. So we're, we're literally um, stimulating those structures to repair themselves. Um, it's very, very exciting field because these are the patients where everything's normal in x-ray, everything's normal in MRI, but they're clearly in, in serious dysfunction. They, they go to their physical therapist, they go to their Pilates class, they can't get strong. And what's happening a lot of times are the ligaments are, the, are holding them back. Um, they're, they just, they're too loose or they've been damaged, so they, they keep re-injuring. And so using a series of injections right into the ligaments or the tendons or the joints, we can stimulate them to heal themselves. And it's life-changing for a lot of people. Now, that's just one part of the, the story. The first thing they need is, is to be aligned. Second thing they need to do is for us to stimulate the ligaments or, or tendons. And third thing they do is to get strong with their physical therapy, Pilates, or however they're gonna do that. But it, it's, it's a program. They can't just do it. I can't just do it and they go home and then they get in trouble again. Yeah. Can you um, tell us a little bit about what what kind of a person would you see? Sorry, I'm going off script a little. I'm gonna. <laughs> so, what kind of a person walks in to see you usually? Okay, I just want to say it's so nice to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you too. <laughs> you're, you're still in Switzerland. I am still in Switzerland. Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, th again, thank you for having me. Um, so I, I see it's such, such a spectrum. On the far end of the spectrum is a disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a disease of serious hypermobility. And among that group, you know, they may come in because they injured their hip surfing, or they may come in in a wheelchair. So, so you know, they can be really functional or very minimally functional. On the other end of the spectrum of people I see are people who are simply, um, you know, they injured their meniscus or they have a chronic ankle sprain. Um, so, 
so the the folks that are really truly hypermobile and 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 it's interesting as you guys know there's so much now more about fascia so when mm -hmm. we, what we find is there's something called tensegrity where something let's say the shoulder gets injured and they they have this chronically dysfunctional shoulder sca scapula issue now their hip is acting up and they've got a chronically you know ex excessively mobile hip and pretty soon their knee is a problem and so this this it's a total body dysfunction that can really change their lives but anyway back to the question so so i see the whole spectrum so i can easily just treat an ankle sprain and that's it and i treat him once or twice or however many times i never see him again other people you know i i have a lady who only got out of bed two minutes every hour for years. Now she's up and around all the time. She's talking to her husband, but it took me at least a year and a half to get her that way. We just kept strengthening and strengthening and strengthening. She, she had lost so much strength that she finally got back into therapy. She couldn't really do much physical therapy because she, she would go out of place. Um, so it's the gamut. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And when is it indicated, what kind of person should we be looking for that if somebody's coming in, we get a lot of people, especially I think in the Pilates realm, in physical therapy as well now, um, they can come to us almost as a first resort. Um, and so they're landing in our clinic or in our studio and what, what are some flags or what are some signs that we might see for somebody who would need prolotherapy or who could benefit from it? Yeah, I, um, there's the crowd that just can't get strong. You know, you, you keep seeing them and they're so sincere. They try so hard, but they're not getting anywhere. And you start to wonder, are they really doing their exercise? They're trying but they can't their their ligaments aren't holding them so the muscles can't get strong the tendons aren't holding so the muscles can't get strong the the typical pattern is like like in the case of something like sacroiliac instability the si is loose um they can sort of train strengthen their transversus as you know as you guys are desperately trying to get them to do it <laughs> but the si is loose and what happens is then the tendons around the hips will tighten up so you'll see the rectus femoris, you know, the gluteus medius, the adductors super tight, you know, and you think, okay, well, let's, let's start by strength, stretching these guys out. But what they're trying to do is support that SI. When you really look at it, everything kind of falls apart when the, when things loosen up a little bit. So, mm -hmm. so I'd say somebody who, who doesn't, doesn't get strong or somebody who, who has a lot of pain after their, after their treatment, it keeps having this pain syndrome. Like, this doesn't make sense to me at all. Or the weird stuff that's clearly just ligamentous, like ankle sprains, <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's the most commonly sprained thing. And something like, um, like CMC arthritis, you know, that, that mm -hmm. first CMC joint is so mobile. Um, and it's very hard for people to not overuse it. If we strengthen that with some dextrose prolotherapy or PRP, now they can get their wrist and their and their forearm strong. Mm -hmm. There's so Great. many TMJ, <laughs> neck yes. pain, tinnitus. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about PRP? I think it's such an amazing treatment, um, such an amazing concept even. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, let's start with the the, the whole umbrella of proliferative medicine. So under the umbrella of proliferative medicine is stimulating the tendons and, and ligaments. And, and what I do with that, let's suppose in the case of the first CMC, I just go around the ligaments of that joint with a needle with either dextrose prolotherapy or PRP. Um, under this umbrella is also stem cells, but really that's only useful interarticularly. So, so, so now we've mapped out where we need to go. And interestingly, in addition to the ligaments going around that CMC, there's also the adductor tendons, 
there's also the triquetrum. There's all these other um, scapher lunate ligament that are also supporting that first little, that first little joint. So we go very carefully and we and with a with a needle, either in that syringe is either dextrose twenty five percent or PRP. So let's start with the dextrose. So the normal physiologic amount of dextrose in the body is 5%. When we put in 25%, the body thinks that, oh, other, there's something wrong here. And we'll create an inflammatory response as a result of that. So that's kind of the mildest way. And it's certainly not toxic. It's, it is proliferative. What, re, what results is proliferation and healing and regeneration of those ligaments and tendons. For PRP, that stands for platelet-rich plasma. You've probably seen it, all the athletes get it, you know, Steph Curry, Tiger Woods, everybody. Um, that involves drawing the blood, spinning it down, and when you spin down the blood, what you're doing is you're putting it in a centrifuge and it's, it's separating by weight. So the heaviest weight is the red cells, the lightest weight is the plasma, and what's in between are the platelet-rich layer. That layer is full of inflammatory and growth, growth factors. So that's what we insert, and that's what we'll be injecting into that CMC joint and at the ligaments around it, is the platelet-rich layer. And not only does it stimulate healing of the ligaments, but it also provides growth factor, which helps the healing of the ligaments. So it's, it's much stronger. My experience is, is that the dextrose prolotherapy is about 20% as strong as the PRP. It's at least five times stronger. <clears throat> and so it heals. So there's our three phases after that. So now we've injected the patient is sore and swollen and it's kind of they're kind of happy because that swelling all that fluid we put in it's like wow i'm stable i'm stable i can move around it doesn't hurt and it 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 feels you know kind of black and blue but stable that goes away by about three to five days and then they're just like they were before or or clinically they feel like they were before they feel as though nothing happened that's usually when I get a phone call, nothing happened. <laughs> but it, the process takes about four to six weeks to take effect. So I, we just kind of support them through it. In that first inflammatory phase, in that first three to five days, I don't recommend that they do a lot. They're just sore and inflamed. I don't want to inflame them even more. Um, I just want them to rest and let that process heal. After about three to five days, then they can go back to doing what they were doing before we did the injections. So if they can't, you know, cut up vegetables, then they still can't cut up vegetables. But they can, you know, open a car door and work on their computer a little bit because that's what they were able to do before. Slowly, they'll start getting better. And, they, and in this time, they can be doing physical therapy. They can be doing Pilates. Um, but by week four, what, what they'll find is they just feel better. They just feel like, wow, I can, I can open that car door. I can get on my bike. Usually. <laughs> they'll kind of start to push themselves into what they can do. And that's when you can increase the amount or the, the depth of the physical therapy you're doing. Because now we're getting somewhere. It's at four weeks where we're really starting to get somewhere and we can start progressing them. Um, be careful here though, because patients, they, they wanna run. They've been waiting all this time and they wanna see how good they are. So, so now, you know, the same lady who's gotten on her bike, she's getting it out of her car, she's on the computer. Hey, maybe I can do handstands. Ooh, no, not so much. <laughs> now they're back in my clinic. <laughs> and so, so it's a steady progression and it does involve the, the, the strengthening piece is huge. So you guys have a big role here. So, and, and carefully strengthening. So it does involve, you know, systematically improving their symptoms. And it, it's a wonderful thing. If, if we all kind of go steadily, steadily, we really get somewhere. 
do you how soon so you said three to five days um they're feeling sore and stiff and swollen i'm assuming in those three to five days or even for a prolonged period of time you wouldn't want them doing much to decrease that inflammation you want to stimulate that inflammatory response correct exactly exactly and, and in fact we used to like everybody to take uh to use heat uh, after the treatments but we found that with prp uh there are pigmentations on the skin that's long lasting so we don't recommend heat and interestingly ice is okay even though it is somewhat of an anti-inflammatory we recommend ice we don't recommend any anti-inflammatories like aspirin motrin advil um, no turmeric, no ginger, um, anything that's anti-inflammatory, we don't want. They can take Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And that lasts for four to six weeks or that no, lasts no, for no, just, just kind of... be, really up to 10 days, just to be careful, okay. we'll take 10 days. Mm -hmm. And we don't let okay. them eat it 48 hours before. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, are there, is it possible for someone to get too tight after therapy, does that happen? It's an interesting question. You know, I, I don't think so. Um, because the, you know, um, well, for instance, suppose I'm treating a ligament a, a, around um, a vertebra, right? Mm -hmm. I find this, I call it the, um, the oh, it's the triangle. I, I see it at the first rib, posterior shoulder, and about T6 or T4. It's, that's an unstable pattern to me. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, let's suppose I'm treating T4. If it's rotated, I've got to treat both sides. If it's rotated mm -hmm. anteriorly, that means on the left side, it's rotated posteriorly on the right side. So I've got to treat both sides. There is a, a chiropractor who I have great respect for who tells me sometimes I tighten his patients up too much on one side. It's perfect on the other, but too tight. And then he goes about loosening them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I get good results. Um, yeah. And I, I trust him. I have not messed <laughs> up in my own exam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like, to me, it seems like it's not as possible that that wouldn't be the case. Or even if it was, I'd almost be a little happy in a hypermobile person if they were a little too tight and we were then working to lengthen over time. Yes, but, so easy to lengthen. Yes, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then um, so how, and I, this is probably a very open-ended question, but how many treatments, say if we take a simple a simple situation like maybe a chronic ankle sprain. Do, is it after one session or are there multiple sessions usually of treatment or what? Do, where do you usually see results? I don't know until I treat them once. But okay. um, like I said, the PRP is so much stronger. It And it depends on the severity of their sprain. You know, if they walk in and they're mm -hmm. collapsing with each step, it's gonna take a while. So, mm -hmm. so some people really, it's real, it's one treatment and we're really done, really done. Other people, for instance, my EDS and hyper, really hypermobiles, I'll see them for a year or two and we're, we'll start with a shoulder and then we have to do the SI. But let's suppose we're just going to do the shoulder. It's about an average of three for most people and depends on how long they've had it, how old they are and the severity of the instability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and what's interesting about the shoulder, I mean, so often it's anterior and posterior capsular instability. But the capsule's unstable, but they're holding. They're they're tightening up at their pectoralis and their latissimus. Mm -hmm. And so as we stretch that out, then then we then we come into the instability and we find it. And and then we can treat that. But sometimes, you know, it's you guys that are uncovering oh, okay, we've gotten them stretched out here and they're still really having a pain syndrome. And it, so much is anterior capsule, posterior capsule. Mm -hmm. is, there a, is there an area of the body that you see most commonly? You've mentioned SI joint, we've mentioned ankle, um, we've mentioned shoulder. Those are the joints that are more ligamentous 
then, well, obviously shoulder has a lot of freedom of motion. A side joint takes a lot of weight in its motions in all the directions and very ligamentous. Are those m most common joints you would say that you're treating? Um, I don't know. It's, it, they come in, they come in, probably you guys find it too, they come in runs, you know? There was a time <laughs> for about a, a couple of months, all I saw was feet, just, just collapsing arches. And I love feet because they're so complicated. They're, they're really amazing to treat. And, and you can get in there and, and stabilize that subtalar joint and the plantar ligament, you know, and really stabilize that arch and help treat the bunion. And so, so I'll, I'll get into a foot mode for a while. And then sometimes it's the neck, you know, really the neck, especially at the transition of the cervical and trans, uh, thoracic spine. Um, I do, I do find, as you guys know, that SI is sort of the kingpin of the spine. And if that is not stable, nothing else is really going to hold very well. Um, I also find um, just the easy, easy treatments are the meniscal tears in the knees. Those I usually just treat once or twice, but, but recalcitrant are the elbows. They go on and on and on and on. And, and so sometimes it may take a lot of treatments for that one. Um, yeah, I, I, so, so I guess since I have to treat elbows a lot and SIs a lot, and next a lot, I guess it would be those three that I see a lot of, and shoulders. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Great. So at, at what point, um, and, you, and you kind of spoke to this already, but at what point would they start stretching? So say somebody is in treatment for prolotherapy or, or PRP, and there may be different answers for the two, but at what point do they start stretching again? How long do they want to sit tight and rest those to give it time to shorten or tighten before you want them opening stretching? Yeah, it's it's still the three to five days. I, I really okay. want them to rest in that time. And then over a prolonged, like we, I, I was trying to come up, I sent you a little note about where to start with somebody. So if they're in treatment, uh, kind of the the idea that I have, and you can maybe speak to it and tell me if this, is, if this would be ideal or not. But I always think about stability first, yeah. isometric deep stabilizers, just working towards creating that stability now that they have something and getting muscles to fire. And then starting from there into small controlled motions, maybe more closed chain than open chain. Um, and then starting to move to those larger motions, maybe introducing more open chain work and then more, moving into more functional movements, bigger, bigger motions, like bigger striding, um, I, walking up two steps at a time. That for me is a big motion for some people, you know, is that sort of the right? And then going into sports and activities after that, is that sort of the right pathway you would think to helping them? I was so impressed when you wrote that. That's exactly what I would love to see. First, first the okay. isometric, then the small, then the bigger, and the bigger. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm so happy to hear you doing that. It just, I, I just once again feel like oh, Sina. She just knows this stuff. <laughs> she really oh, did this. You. There's a guy who wrote a a, a book on the, the physical therapy for hypermobility EDS patients mm -hmm. that I I look at a lot. Um, what is his name? Um, Kevin Muldowney, yes. and I think, I think you know he, he's he's the same way, just like what you said. Primarily isometric, but then very small motions as the improvement begins. And even mm -hmm. even the motion, I have to tell you, for some of my patients, is too much for the for the very um, poorly functioning EDS. So mm -hmm. you just it's just slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then. Um, I also wanted you to, to ask you about the perineural injection therapy a little bit more. Maybe, do you mind just taking the floor on that for a moment and letting us, telling us more about that? So, <clears throat> perineural injection is a, a means by which to simply stop the nerve conduction, the pain fibers from the nerve conduction from, um, from talking. So, in we use very superficial injections around the nerve, not into the nerve. It just shuts off the trip V1 receptors 
and stops the nerve from conducting. Um, this is something to do in someone who has recalcitrant nerve pain in a very, um, not in not a diffuse manner. So something like peripheral neuropathy, it's not gonna help so much. But something like sciatica, it does help. We can literally go into the sciatic notch and just inject um, this pretty much dextrose right along the course of that sciatic nerve and it turns it off. The downside is it's uh, cumulative. So um, the first injection will only last a few hours. After that, it will be a few more hours. Even more after is up to the third injection. And by the fourth, it's a couple of days. And by the fifth, maybe a week. Um, and then little by little, we just keep doing more. In patients who have recalcitrant nerve pain, it's really nice because it just shuts it down. They don't feel numbness. It's not like lidocaine. The pain is just not there. And it's a weird thing because I don't know if you guys have ever had pain, but your mind is always on that. And all of a sudden, it's not there. Um, so so they, they feel like, did something just happen? It's confusing. But then little by little, they start to relax into it. Like, yeah, wow, this pain is not there anymore. That's great. Um, I just want to say one other thing I forgot to mention, which is sometimes I use, I'm going to go back to proliferative medicine. Sometimes I use ozone uh, with the proliferance, so, which is useful for people who are old or um, have poor protoplasm, they're not well, they have cancer or something. It really helps strengthen the treatments that we do. Ozone is, um, is in itself anti-inflammatory, so I don't use it at the same time as I use the proliferant. I'll use it two weeks later to stimulate the healing. Okay, now we'll go back to the perineural. So anyway, that the perineural is great. It's just with somebody who's got a lot of patience and who has a lot of, um, just a lot of pain and nothing else works. It's, it's not for somebody who has a pain due to a disc and they've got the potential for surgery. I'd rather have them, you know, get rid of the cause but it's somebody where there's no other way to get rid of the pain. It's remarkable. Great. Great. I was going to leave the rest of the time, if that's okay, for people to ask questions. To um, So I wanted to open the floor. If you wanted to ask a question, just so that we don't get all muddled, if you could unmute while you're talking or asking your question, then mute again. That way we don't end up blocking each other out. Um, so please just go ahead if you have a question and um, just maybe make a signal or go ahead and unmute and ask the question and off we go. Hey, Dr. Mayer, th thank you so much for coming today and talking to us. And I was actually alerted, you know, thank you for doing that, for letting me know that this, this was going on because we had this discussion about hypermobility a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, and um, I actually recently got a PRP. I've had this about my fourth one um, in my hip, but uh, just the second one in my hip, but I've had two in my knees. I mean, I have good results, but actually asking for a client of mine, you know, it is difficult when people um, talk about peripheral neuropathy, and I'll identify myself as a physical therapist, is that, um, is that he has a lot of comorbidities, you know, he's in early 60s, and this is where I guess you ask him for medical help. But the thing is, this poor guy has he was put in a boot for his lower extremity because he was uh, diagnosed with foot drop. And it was super undetermined, like what was really causing the foot drop. Yeah, and I'm sure you know that. So, you know, because it could be like you're saying from the spine. So he's got some degeneration in his low back. I hate to say it, and I don't mean to be flip. Most of us do. And then, you know, it's that is that, um, and then, you know, then he did have um, a kidney removed because he had some kidney cancer and it metastasized to his thoracic spine. He had a laminectomy, some radiation. So it's undetermined whether or not it's kind of coming from the radiation scarring and causing neural pathway problems. But anyway, I've been helping him and get, he's been improving. I mean, I got him to get a reformer, <laughs> you know how we are. <laughs> you know, we're constantly trying to, you know, um, so he's definitely really interested in it. Um, and he's taking a lot of meds that do help to damp the pain. Um, 
you know, so this is, it gets all confounded, but I just wish there was another avenue. And given that this could be something that's coming from radiation fibrosis and higher up in the spinal cord or more localized from degenerative disc, and then having been put in a walking boot because of the foot drop for like, honestly, I think a year. Um, oh yeah, yoy. You know, there are so many things down the thing, but he's actually improved a lot. Um, so, I mean, I, maybe this is, you know, a brain teaser, but would you put the prolotherapy in the superficial peroneal nerve, you know, at the fibula, do you put it in the spine, do you, you know, or is somebody not a candidate who's had, you know, um, you know, true radiation, he's now he's got radiation fibrosis where we're not sure where, you know, because it's in the trunk. Um, but the thing is, this guy improves. So, you know, is there hope for somebody with such unbelievable amount of multiple um, possibilities? Wow. Well, first of all, <laughs> I think it's wonderful that you got him better. <laughs> um, well, not a hundred percent or he wouldn't be on meds, you know, but, but he's, he's walking now and I did have to tape him for a long time. And, and it's really odd because he does not have any pain in his identified area of like, like the, uh, the navicular area, the posterior tibialis. He's been identified with that for oodles of years. But when he doesn't, when he's in the morning, when he's not wearing shoes, he has, shoes, he has no pain. Then when he puts on the shoes, then it begins. And it's, you know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> but he's, you know, I don't know. So we've educated him much more. He's much more savvy about how to use his legs. He's working on the reform, you know, like I said, he's doing all kinds of stuff. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know this is hard. But I'm just curious, you know. I, you know, it might be interesting to do a nerve conduction study to see if we can find out if it's, you know, more central or more peripheral, uh, the source of his neuropathy. Um, I agree. What's that? I agree. <laughs> in in terms of what what to do, do you think there's any component of CRPS in the foot at all? You know, how could it not be um, centralized or not, how could it not be regionalized is what I should say, perhaps, you know, so um, you know, that means chronic regional pain syndrome. Yeah. Um, for those of you that aren't used to all the letters, but, you know, and how many of our clients still come in with these sorts of things in, um, you know, and that's what it is, is, is that, you know, the whole body's getting oversensitized. Um, and then suddenly you've got this thing that's persistent pain that, you know, it's hard to know how much of it is actually in the brain too. So, um, so I can't imagine you inject it in the brain. <laughs> I would say um, if there's a component of, um, of, of chronic regional pain syndrome, we could try something like um, perineural around the foot. And that's really carefully done. We start from far away because putting needles around that painful place is just carefully, carefully done. But I do want to say, um, if he, if his thoracic spine had a tumor in it less than a year ago, then we can't really do PRP at this time. We have to wait at least a year um, because there are there are small amounts of stem cells in the PRP, and we don't want oh, to. Oh, I see them. what you're saying. Okay, yeah, because he'd definitely be frightened to death. But, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. who wouldn't, you know? Yeah. Um, what did you yeah, say? And, yeah, he wouldn't. And it had actually, what it had metastasized the actual bone. And um, so that's why he had the laminectomy. But, yeah. but yes, okay, That thank you for saying that. Because I guess that's what I was wondering, because I do work with the oncology group, you know, some cancer group. And so you're always wanting to find something, or some new little niche that, will then help them to get more where they want to be. Because he wants to go to Africa to go see where the, you know, um, Jane Wood, all the monkeys are, you know, the big ones. So it's, <laughs> um, So So yeah. if, if you find on the nerve conduction that it's really coming from the thoracic spine and he's had a laminectomy, there's probably laxity there. And so I yeah, would- there use, is. Yeah, yeah, so then I would just use some dextrose prolotherapy if, if that seems to be useful for if his back is an issue, you know? Um, yeah, the kyphosis is increasing and he's a, he's a, a real kyphotic guy to begin with. Yeah. He's tall. 
and it's you know it's it's so it's and it's been difficult to strengthen him that way because any kind of like true extension stuff I try to do with him, um, you know, it can also set up on a dorsal nerve, you know, kind of also into the diaphragm pain. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's been tricky business. <laughs> Absolutely, I I would consider I mean, probably to dominate, but you know, it's, yeah. yeah. I'd consider and, Prolo in that area. I, I think it would help. Thank you. That helps a lot. Okay. Other questions out there? Hi, I'm Allegra. Um, thank you so much for um, giving us some information and coming here today. I really appreciate um, it and just hearing about it. Um, so I don't, I'm a person that I don't know a, a bunch about what you're speaking of, but a couple of things, you know, um, come to mind. And I guess, you know, I guess I can just maybe speak about my own situation or maybe my friends. Um, so something like, so, you know, I have a, a minor torn meniscus. I've never gotten surgery for it. So it sounds like this is something that I could use to, you know, help, help with that pain there. But I'm sort of wondering like, what's well, okay. So what's the cost for this and like how much, you know, time or, or treatments are we looking at, you know? That's a good question because it's not covered by insurance, which is really, you know, unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, so if we were going to do dextro, so interestingly about the meniscus of the knee, um, gosh, I want to go get my knee model, but anyway, <laughs> So uh, underneath we're, we're pretty familiar with anatomy here, so not okay. not sorry. So <laughs> meniscus on either side, there's something called the coronary ligaments, mm -hmm. and it's the coronary ligaments that are loose that cause the meniscus to move. Mm. It's because we can't go right into the meniscus itself; it doesn't have a good blood supply. Right, we treat just below. Mm -hmm. So and it, so the cost for treating a meniscus with dextrose prolotherapy is four hundred, and for PRP it's a thousand. Mm, okay. And when you say how many, I don't know. Hard to <laughs> say. Yeah. We just start with one, and and then we always just wait six weeks and see how you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the um, what is it? Something that they put you under, or you just go in there and they? It's like getting your blood drawn or something. Yeah, for the PRP, no, we don't put. You, well, we can. We have a <laughs> surgery center. We can um, go to. Uh, but it adds a lot to the cost. It adds about sixteen hundred dollars. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. And it's a rare person that wants that. So we can give you some narcotics, pain medication, and then we always numb with some lidocaine before we treat. Mm -hmm. And so it's uncomfortable. What it feels is like a very deep ache. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but it's manageable. It really is. Mm -hmm. and I've had it on my own body many times, and you know. I guess it hurts so good because you, you just got to keep in mind, this is going to really help me. And, you know, we're talking through it. You may say, boy, I need a moment. I need a break. It's okay. We, mm -hmm. we advise people to bring in music. They can sing or they can meditate or deep breathe either way. Okay. Thank you for that. And then I guess just, this is sort of similar to my last question, but, um, so I have a friend that has pretty bad sciatica and um, I think part of it's just her working situation. She's a massage therapist, so a lot of loaded flexion. Um, you know, and every probably six months she gets like cortisone shots, which I guess is something that takes it away right away. But it sounds like, you know, the therapy that you're offering, it's like a little bit at a time, you know, and it sounds like it could really benefit, you know, someone like that. I think you mentioned it to her. Well, that's, I'm glad you brought it up because we know that cortisone degenerates the ligaments. It's the opposite of what we want to do. Mm. So it's the world's best anti-inflammatory and it does take care of the pain. So when you're up against the wall, it's something and people do it, you know, and what can we do? It, for us, when someone's had some cortisone, we always wait six weeks to make sure that's out of the system before we can, we can treat with, with our PRP. Or right. mm -hmm. For your friend, I want to know the source of the sciatica. Mm. You know, is this a facet impingement? And it sounds like, I, I don't know, <laughs> if it's really a disc pushing in, then I then I can't do anything. That that right? Would be oh, that's right. You said right for disc stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if it's a facet issue, usually um, it's, you know, 
irregular motion on the facet grinding it and causing too much motion and then when she moves it moves out of place and pushes on the nerve yeah and so if that's the case yeah we can treat that facet easy okay i would probably go with prp because it's so strong you know but I'd, I'd have to see her okay all right well i was just curious thank you so much um i don't want to take up any more of your time i'm sure other people have lots of questions so thank you so much thank you Um, so I have questions about how you determine the um, location of your injection. Is it an ultrasound guided process? And how do you know that you're in the right spot for the process? It's a great question. So I'm a sports medicine doc and I used to teach anatomy, musculoskeletal anatomy before I took up prolotherapy. And in the training of prolotherapy, it was profoundly humbling. People call us really anatomists because we feel <laughs> the ligaments and the tendons. We feel the insertion sites. And that's how we know where we are. If I don't, if I'm not sure, I have an ultrasound that I use. And especially in around the spine and the neck, I use an ultrasound. But something particularly, you know, the elbow, you can feel exactly where you are and you have to know that. So it's a lot of anatomy. If I'm not sure, we use the ultrasound, but it would be crazy to use an ultrasound on such a superficial area. In the shoulder, for instance, the supraspinatus insertion site is a common place for tears. So we always use an ultrasound there. Um, it, it, it's kind of variable, but the important thing is you gotta know your anatomy cold, just every little thing. Your hands should be feeling what it needs to feel. Got it. I have one more question. Um, and this one has to do with um, the, the process of sort of like mast cell activation or a body's like overreaction to any type of foreign substance. And is this, um, are there contraindications or is this something that you encounter on a, on a basis? Interestingly, that I see that with my uh, Ehlers-Danlos folks, uh, this hyperemia mast cell activation that occurs. And uh, sometimes we can, we can, so I begin with that group with 15% dextrose. I don't want a huge, huge inflammatory response because they will get that mast cell act activation. So we, we gently, gently increase the um, stimulus with them. And sometimes we just have to support them through that activation that may occur afterwards. Got it. Thank you. You're very welcome. One thing we didn't talk about was how long it lasts. And my experience is, is once we get, we get support, we get the pain-free state and a person is back to their baseline where they, where they wish they were, I'm done. I won't see anybody. I won't see that person for a long time. Occasionally, after a couple of years, they'll come back and, and they won't be nearly as bad as they were before. They'll say, I'm starting to feel loose again or the, or the knees acting up a little bit again. And we just, we just do a kind of a tune up and then I don't see him again. So it is a very long lasting treatment. Presuming they're doing their strengthening, which is your guys' job. <laughs> Gloria, I'm gonna go back and ask one more question in relationship to the mast cell activation. Is there a difference there if you did a PRP use the or they use their own cells, the blood cells, to re-inject rather than using the dextrose. Do you see a difference, or uh, is there always the de dextrose involved anyway? Oh no, I I either use PRP or dextrose. Or dextrose. Yeah, and so in in a mast cell activation purse, I would start with just the dextrose and even a lower concentration, in the hope that I can get somewhere with without a, such a strong activation response. Mm -hmm. And if you were using the PRP instead of dextrose, that wouldn't decrease the likelihood of a mast cell uh, reaction or? It, it would increase it because it's more oh, okay. inflammatory. Um, oh, okay, okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we'll, we'll go to that anyway and we just have to support them through it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if since it, it comes from their own blood cells, if maybe there would not be that mast cell reaction, but it seems like that's not really the case. It might even just be the injecting. Yeah, it, it's a great theory, 
because it is their own stuff. And still, though, it's it really is irritating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So I have a question. Um, uh, what would you um, say needs to happen for insurance companies to realize that this is beneficial and more beneficial than cortisone, which they do pay for? That is the million dollar question. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, in our, it, I'm, I'm with the Hackett Hemwell Foundation and we are the people who, where our focus is anatomy and prolotherapy. We love ligaments and tendons and that's our world. And so at our meetings, we're always asking this question, how can we get insurance to pay for it? And we, the answer we always come up with is more research. And so over the years, there has been more research. It's funded by the prolotherapists who do it. We have some universities who fund it, like some of our docs work for the University of Wisconsin. We have another guy up in North Dakota. Um, so, so they'll get some funding here and there. We'll publish a study and then, you know, I'll talk to other doctors and they'll say, yeah, yeah, it still doesn't work. <laughs> Oh, geez, but it does. So I think it's studies. I, I think it is. I have to say, um, and, I, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but when I see a patient, I take my time I, and I really do a complete job on each joint. And I worry about the idea of, of insurance coming in and say, OK, you've got 20 minutes and just kind of rah, rushing through it. You know, I, I, I I'm just don't know that the results would be as good. Yeah. 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 I understand. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for being here. This is very interesting. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate you all wanting to know it. it we go, we, we work hand in hand on this. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. Hi, Min Jay, I, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I go ahead. This is Min Jay. Hi. And, um, I'm sorry I wasn't here for the beginning, but did you talk at all about spinal stenosis? We, we didn't specifically talk about spinal stenosis um, and spinal stenosis can have, um, it can be different varying degrees of severity. So when the spine is just stuck, when it's just clearly arthritically stuck, I can't help that. But if it's interesting, and, th and that will be spinal stenosis, there's other things we call spinal stenosis where there is arthritis around the, the vertebra and the facets, um, which we can help. So, so sometimes I, I see on their examination, if I can put them in a position where they're not having symptoms, then I know I can probably help them. If, they're, if it's chronic and recalcitrant, I can't help them and they really need surgery. Thank you. I wanted to throw a question out to Wendy and Karen, if I might, to just ask, because they're located in England. And I wanted to ask if you know if prolotherapy and PRP is covered in England by insurance at all, or what the situation there is. I don't know anything about the insurance side, but I know that two of my clients over the last few years, one went abroad to have treatment for her knees and she raved about it. She, I think she had to go back three times or something. That was, that there was a plan, but she paid for it, but it wasn't madly expensive. I mean, I think, I can't remember if she went to Greece or somewhere like that and had it done, but it was what, what I thought was in the quite early stages of, people even knowing about it. I mean, maybe it's been going on a lot longer, but that was the first time I heard about it and they felt it was quite new. And then another client who by that time, there was probably someone in Harley Street, which is like the private doctor street in London. And um, there was somebody, I think, doing it there. And I think she does have private health insurance. The other one might as well. Whether it was covered or not, I would have to ask them. I don't know. Thank you. I I appreciate that question. I have a patient coming from London to treat for us to treat her. So if I knew the name of the person, I could keep her there. <laughs> it's a long way. <laughs> um. There were two. 
One is one is Christina and one is Linda. But Lin Linda was going to someone in London and Christina was going abroad. But yes. I, I, I don't remember the details because oh. I haven't seen, I haven't seen, they haven't come to classes online since lockdown. They wouldn't come to Zoom classes. So I haven't seen them face to face for some time now. But I can contact them and I can ask them and find out. Yeah. That'd be great. Any other questions? We've got just a few more minutes. I think it was I think it was their own blood that was being used in both their cases. And and I think that made them feel safe. I, but I think that was the case. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll check with them and I'll find out because it was a while back. But I have to say, I was really tempted and that kind of, because I've got bad knees and hoping for a time when it was everywhere and the price had come down. <laughs> but it does sound very, very interesting. Yeah. We definitely use the patient's own blood. That that's, yeah, because it would be there'd be a huge inflam there'd be a huge response if we didn't. There is talk now of using amniotic fluid cells. So, um, interestingly, you know, and it's kind of initially it was touted as stem cells, but we're finding there are no stem cells, and it, it we're finding it's no more effective than the patient's own blood. So I would definitely stick with your own stuff. <laughs> Okay. Great. Well, I can't thank you guys enough for being here. Um, if you uh, have other questions that come up and you want to send them my way, I, or I think I included in the invite uh, Gloria's direct email or her website, which I think you can contact her directly through. If you have questions, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for you, that she wouldn't mind <laughs> having questions come through. Um, but if you have questions that you want, um, you can also send them my way and I will, I will find answers for you uh, as well. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much for being here. So, and thank you, Gloria, so much for taking the time. It means a lot. Um, and it's just nice to, to have you help us out and so that we can just be more of that team approach. I always appreciate having people like you talk to people like us because it makes us all better, I feel like in the end. So I really, really appreciate and, and so grateful that you would take the time. You're so, so. welcome and I'm so grateful to be asked to come. I, I'm mostly grateful that, that we all have a piece of the pie, a piece of the puzzle. And it's so exciting to put it together and, and help more people it's, it's a great time and i agree i just i just love working in, in concert with everyone else so thank you again for having me and thank you for listening and being open to this discussion <laughs>